Well, hello, hello, Victory Family Church. How are we doing today? All right. Good stuff. Well, hey, I want to welcome our church family, not only here in Cranberry, but in Meadville, Newcastle. Those of you joining us online, come on. One church across multiple locations. It's a blessing to be a part of. If we haven't met before, um, Pastor Sean Moore, my wife Sarah, and I are the campus pastors up at our Meadville location. And so greetings from up north. And it is a blessing to be part of one church across multiple locations. I uh, want to share a quick, quick thing on that in, and the blessing that comes a part of that. You're part of a bigger family than you can see in the room or wherever you may be <laughs> through the camera lens. But uh, we had somebody that had some, some physical health issues and they had to be transferred from a hospital uh, from our campus uh, in, in Meadville up in that area and be transferred down into the Pittsburgh area. And actually the, the person that was involved in transporting them, they came to find out that they actually attend the Cranberry campus of Victory. And, so that, and that just really ministered some peace to their heart uh, in the midst of what they were going through. So, man, they're such a blessing to be part of the body of Christ as a part of Victory. And, uh, and of course, even beyond that, we got brothers and sisters all over the world for that matter. But it's a blessing, again, to be together. And, of course, just want to honor and thank Pastor John and Michelle Nuzo. Wherever you are, whatever you're doing, hope you're getting filled up. We love you. We miss you. Can't wait to have you back again real soon. Uh, last week, we started a new series called Grow and Go. And uh, really this whole series is geared around taking our next steps and growing up with God, but not just to grow, but to go, to apply, to make the impact and make a difference, apply the things that we're talking about. God's given us steps toward that because, uh, yeah, you know, that there's nothing much sadder than a 30-year-old living in his parents' basement, right? I mean, you just kind of go... They've grown in stature, but you got to go, right? Like parents, you, you love your kids, right? And, and, and it's wonderful, wonderful to have them. But at some point, you got to grow and go. Like get out of the house, make some space. We need to use your bedroom and, and turn it into something we've always wanted to use it for, right? I mean, just whatever it is, if you're in that stage of life. But uh, to grow and to go, and spiritually it can be easy as a believer to fall into that same temptation. We're growing in knowledge, information, but, but it doesn't live. It doesn't actually go out. And so we don't, we're not going to be that way. We're going to grow and to also go. And last week we looked at spending daily time with God as one of the steps, a part of that. This week we're looking at the topic of serving. Serving. And I want to begin by looking at this passage, which is going to be basically the outline of the message. And so if you have a Bible, whatever, of course, it's always on the screen, but we're going to go to 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 10 and 11. 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 10 and 11. It says, As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. Whoever speaks as one who speaks oracles of God. Whoever serves is one who serves by the strength that God supplies, in order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. To him be, belong glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. If you're titling your notes today, taking notes to capture the thoughts that God would impart to your heart, which I recommend that you do, you can title this, Gifted to Serve. Gifted to Serve. Serve. Question for you. Have you ever had an experience at a restaurant with your server that was less than ideal? Anybody have one of those? <laughs> different, different I'm sure we all can relate to that. Let me just share one funny one. This wasn't really a, a bad experience, just a humorous one to, to kind of kick us off. Uh, I was at a, a place getting breakfast with my wife and uh, ordered something that had eggs. And the waitress asked me, the server asked me, uh, well, how do you want your eggs? I said, scrambled. And then she asked me, do you want cheese on those eggs? And I said, yes, please. And then she asked, what kind of cheese do you want on your eggs? And I said, I'm not sure. What cheese do you have? And she said, well, we only have American. Which I didn't say this, but I thought, why did you ask me exactly, right? I said, like, was she just going to let me go through the list? Like, cheddar, and eh, Colby, and eh, try again. Like, I have to, like, pick the right thing to find. Like, you won. It's American, you know. Like, anyway, 
minor thing, but maybe you've had like an actual like bad, bad experience, right? Where you walk in, you sit down, and you can just tell, I'm not sure you should have come in today. <laughs> right? I don't know what's going on in your life, but like, man, I feel like I need to serve you right now. Can I pray for you or, or something? And you can just tell by their expression, and they welcome you with all the enthusiasm of a lump of coal. Like, hey, what do you want? You know, whatever, like, what are we drinking today? You know, or whatever. And you kind of go, I'm like, oh, I'm not, doesn't seem exactly excited to be there. And they get your order and all kind of stuff. And, and or you ever had this where they just disappear? Like, you had a server and I need something, maybe it's a refill or whatever. You don't want to be a bother because maybe you already feel like a burden, like, oh, like I can tell they're not happy or whatever. But then they're just, they're just gone. I, I need, if you ever see our server, but you never do. I don't know where they go. There's a cove, there's a cave, there's something somewhere. I remember hearing a, a comedian recently on this special talk about how his family, they were out to uh, eat a meal and they ordered, so they had put in their order and they never saw their server again. And they came to find out later that that server literally quit their job after getting their order and left. <laughs> and so they're just sitting there, sitting there, sitting there. And, he, and, and the way the community puts it, it's like, I, I just wonder, where are they? Like, where are they now? Do they ever think of us? Wondering if we're still sitting there, you know. But, but server experiences, in contrast to when you go to Chick-fil-A. You go in there and you order something. Everybody's on it. They're happening. And you tell them, thank you. And they say, my Pleasure, and you think I think you mean that? Thank you, you, you know. And it just it, it, I think about it as the difference, the ways in which we can kind of perceive serving and this topic. Sometimes we can see serving as a burden, or even we can see serving, depending upon the task, we can see it as something that's kind of below us, something kind of menial. Like, yeah, I don't know if I want to pick that up, clean that, or whatever. Eh, serving, like, yeah. Thanks, but no thanks. And I think it's this, this difference between, you know, seeing, serving as this have to versus something I, I want to do. That's a, a gift and that's a, a blessing that I'm not just throwing God a bone. I guess I'm a Christian. I should serve. I could do my good deed for the day. But, but, but rather a path to something so much bigger. In fact, Jesus actually said, hey, if you want to be great, you really want to be significant, become a servant. Be a servant. He didn't just say do acts of service, although that's, that's great. But you can look at two servers and they're both doing the same general acts, going through the same checklist, right? They might be bringing you food, bringing the order, all that kind of thing. But, you know, it's different saying, okay, I'm going to do my deed, acts of service. It's different than adopting an identity and an attitude of a servant, this is who I am, not just what I do. And today we want to get to the heart of this because our significance in the kingdom of God and the ways of God is through our service, through serving. It's the way in which Jesus said we become great. And so we want to engage this today. And we, I want to engage in three phrases, basically, that, that here Peter writes in 1 Peter chapter 4 to give us some things related to God's call for every believer to be a servant. How do we engage it? How do we walk this out? And the very first thing, very first phrase that he starts with in regards to serving, he says, as each has received a gift. So if you're taking notes, our first big idea today is you have something to give. You have something to give. See, a server isn't the one that cooks the food, prepares the food, the meal. All they do is they take what they've received and they serve it to the people. And it's the same for you and I. God has freely given us, not something that we earned, that we worked up, that we merited. Well, look at all that I've done to you. No, he's given us gifts. Why? Because God is a giver. I don't know if you know that or not, but God is a giver. In fact, the book of Hebrews says, I can't even come to God unless I believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those that seek him. I don't know what somebody told you about God, what you thought or what your religious experience, but God is a rewarder of those that seek him. In other words, God's a giver. That when you come to him, he's going to give you something. He can't help it. That's just who he, he is. He's given us gifts. I think about one, one gift that he's given. He's given us his son. 
He gave us Jesus on a rescue mission from heaven to earth, lived a sinless life, died upon the cross, shed his blood to remove our sins from us, rose up from the dead. He did all this as we remember today through communion to make us new, restore us into right relationship with God. What a gift of his grace through his son, Jesus. And he then gives us the gift of a mission. The gift of purpose that's so much bigger than any one of us and big enough for all of us. Everybody's got a place to go into all the world and preach the gospel and make disciples and baptize people and teach them and train them the things I've told you, Jesus said. What a mission he's given us. That's a gift. It's a gift of his grace. He's given us life today. He's given us time. We're still breathing. Still breathing. Still living. Time on this earth. He's given us resources. He's given us ultimately what we're zeroing in on today. Is what First Peter has in mind here. He's given us abilities. Abilities. And I see this, let me just say it this way. That you and I are in God's gifted program. You know, you think about in school, if you're not familiar, they'll have a, oftentimes a gifted or giftedness program where they take the students that are really standing out, they're performing really well, and, and they recognize that and they put them in some accelerated learning and, and just different opportunities because, because you're talented. You are gifted, which in some ways unintentionally, right, by omission, you kind of go, well, what's everybody else <laughs> at that point? But, but I can say, you may or may not have been in the gifted program at school, but you're in God's gifted program. That he looked across and he, and he picked you and he chose you and, and he said, I've got a mission for you. I've got a purpose for you. And to help you get that done, you're going to need this. And he gifted you with things by, by your temperament and your personality and abilities. He's gifted you. He's graced you. He's empowered you with the gift of his grace. And we see just a small list of this in Romans chapter 12, verses 6 through 8. Romans 12, 6 through 8. It says, we have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is prophesying, which is speaking under the direct divine influence of God, inspired speaking, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it's serving, then serve. If it is teaching, then teach. If it's to encourage, man, that's a gift, then give encouragement. If it's giving, that's a gift, give generously. If it's to lead, do it diligently. If it's to show mercy, you have a heart of compassion and to serve and help care for people, do it cheerfully. What are these? These are some examples. This isn't exhaustive, exhaustive, but these are God's grace gifts to us. What is that? God's grace gifts, these abilities, it's a measure of God's own ability that he then gives us to fulfill his divine purpose for our lives. It's his divine ability to help fulfill his divine purpose in our lives. But isn't it easy to devalue those things that God has given us? Or even to not even just devalue it, we don't even see it, don't even recognize it sometimes. I think about Charlie Brown. And, uh, of course, all the holiday specials, a lot of fun. Not the newer ones, that the, I mean like the old, old ones, like the classic old ones. And... I remember one of them for the Halloween special one. It's called It's the you know was it? It's the Great Pumpkin Charlie Brown that one. But there's a part where all the kids are out there trick or treating. They're going door to door. They're getting candy in their bags, and after each house they debrief. And so one of them's looking in their bags. Oh, I got this gum. I got gum. I got this, I got a popcorn ball. I guess that was the thing back in the day. Some of you might remember that. But they got all these different things. Like oh, I got this. I got that. And then it gets to Charlie Brown, and he goes. I got a rock. They go to the next house. They get, they get candy again. Like, oh, I got this chocolate bar. I got the. I got a rock. Next house, same thing. I got a rock. Don't you feel for Charlie Brown? I got a rock. Who's the parent handing handing rocks out at the door, right? But you know, if you're not careful, it's so easy 
to have that same perspective that whenever you look at the gifts, you're looking in your goodie bag that you got from God and you're looking around and you see, oh, I see what they got. They can sing. Oh, I see what they got. They can speak. I see what they got. Oh, it's so public. It's so obvious. I wish I could sing do music the way you do this, giftedness the way you, you paint, the way you, the way you do this. And Because it's so obvious. I can see it. It's on display. That looks amazing. But I got a rock. And what I want to encourage you with today, because it's our gifts and the things God's given us, it can feel so familiar that we can miss it by a thousand miles. Because it's just a part of you. But what I would want to encourage you with today is to consider maybe you're looking in your goodie bag of God's gifts and you're going, I got rocks. And God would say, I know you think it's a rock, but I've given you a diamond. It's a gift of my grace. You're not just good at math or interested in grammar and English. You're you're, you're not just somebody that's just a very helpful person because I think, well, I just feel like this is what people should do. You're not just someone that just loves to see details in things or can plan things or whatever. That's not just some small little thing. That's evidence of God's grace. It's a gift. In fact, according to the word of God, the things that are least seen are the most significant. And it's why they're unseen. It's the things that are seen that everybody goes, oh, I want that. Guess what? In God's perspective, it's actually less significant than things that you don't see. Those gifts. The grace of God. And I just want to encourage us, if you're in the, in the dark about, man, I don't even know what my gifts are. What do I got? I'm going to give you just three words to help you on that journey of perhaps discovering that. And, and the first, first word would be passion. What are my gifts? Well, we'll look at passion. What energizes you? What do you get fired up about? What do you get excited about? What's, what's on your heart? Passion. The second one is intuition. Intuition. Where are you intuitive? Where do you just get it that not everybody gets it? I don't really get it, naturally speaking. I don't, I don't really get it a whole lot with being some of these like, like handyman type of stuff. I'd like to be better. I'm getting better, thanks to YouTube. But I don't just naturally, just instantly just get it. Some of y'all, you just, you just get it. That's a gift and a grace from God. God anointed people in the Old Testament to build his temple. Well, that's just natural. I'm just fixing stuff. It's a, it's a grace. Where are you intuitive? Where are you intuitive? I love the quote from John Maxwell. You are intuitive in the area of your giftedness. Intuition shows where you're gifted. The third word, last one, is recognition. Recognition. What do other people recognize about you? Hey, when you did that, you saw that, you said this, I, man, just thank you, that this blessed me the way that I've just noticed this about you. What do other people recognize? Passion, intuition, recognition. He'll give us a picture because God's given you grace, gifts. It might look like a rock, but God's given you diamonds. And the next thing is this. The next phrase in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 10, is after he said, hey, each one of us, no one's excluded. Everybody's got gifts. You have something to give. The next thing that he says is just two words. Use it. So profound. <laughs> Use it. You got a gift. You receive something good, use it. Here's the thing. If, if I bring this into the context of, of the church for a moment, you know, as Christians, it's so easy us, for us to fall into the trap that, that, that Jesus saved us. He did all that he did, died upon the cross, rose from the dead, ascended into heaven, all this. He saved us, and we could act like that Jesus saved us so we can sit. Like, go get in a church and just, just go, go sit. And, so, and get, get fed and soak in the word, soak in the presence of God and worship. God, God, thank you, God. And, we, and there's certainly nothing wrong with that. Pastor John's going to be talking about that in a future week, the importance of gathering together, weekend services. There's things that uniquely happen in that. And last week we talked about sitting in the presence of God through our daily time with him. So it's not a, it's not, this isn't an either or type of situation, but, but we can kind of sit. Like church becomes the place that we go to see other people serve. Right? It's the place that I go to go see the people with, that are gifted for ministry, like the pastor, the preacher. Like that's where they go serve, and we go watch them do their thing. Not seeing that 
wait a minute, the church doesn't exist for me. I am the church and I exist to serve. I exist to, to go out. Whenever Jesus called his 12 apostles to himself from among everybody that was following him at the time, he picks the 12 under the direction of the Lord, of, of the Father, picks the 12, and he says that he did that for two purposes in Scripture. One is to be with him. That's to sit, to be with him, follow him, just to be with him. Soak it up, learn from him. But the second purpose, is said, was to send them out. To preach and deliver people, drive out demons, he gave them authority. So in other words, Jesus didn't just call them to sit, he sent them out. Not just to sit, but to be sent. Not just to sit, but also to be sent and to serve. And it's the same for you and for me. Because 1 Corinthians chapter 12 brings this analogy. And we're part of the body of Christ. And Jesus has set you in it wherever he sees fit. You're gifted for that. You're graced for your part. But you know what? Every part has got to do its part. And whenever we merely stay in sit mode and it never moves to also a serve mode, in a sent mode, it's like you're missing a part of your body. Maybe some of you are here today, and you've had issues with specific organs. I mean, you have, thank goodness your heart hasn't failed today. Like, it's pumping right now. Thank goodness it showed up. It didn't just sit out outside of the body and go, look at that body over there. <laughs> right? Man, it's been sent. It's mobilized. It's, it's, it's active. But I mean, if you've had a part of your body, especially a vital organ, I mean, some, some, some stuff you might be able to kind of live without, but even that you've got to adjust. And you're missing some parts and Oh, man, it can give you some serious issues. Body can't even function the right way. Can I just tell you the significance of your part, no matter how big you think it is or how small you think it is, it is so significant. And it's meant to be used. And I'm just so thankful today that there's people at every campus, every location, in every room, there's people that, that yes, they do take the time to sit and be in the seats that, that we get to be in in here or join us online, and they get to, but they also are sent and they're serving. Aren't you glad there's people over there serving your children? There's people serving the next generation in ministries. People that welcomed you when you walk into the door and clean and stuff. You're not sitting on trash right now. And they have, according to the word of God, this is, I'm kind of going off the script a little bit, but, but, but they actually have an equal reward as what I'm doing right now. Why? Because why shouldn't they? I mean, if you were sitting in garbage right now, I think that'd be a little distracting. And they prepared an environment, prepared a servant, different things. Why every part has its part, and every part gets the reward of the ultimate fruit of it. And that's the gift and the invitation God gives us is hey, use it. Use it. Use it because I gave it to you for a purpose. It's meant to be used. It's gonna, it's gonna make a difference. And and I see this picture. In the parable of the talents, which Jesus told, very commonly told parable. I'll go through this relatively quickly to summarize and just read one part of it. But he gives this parable of the talents where this master gives his three servants different measures of money. A talent was a unit of measure of money. And basically one talent, depending upon what scholars you, you kind of follow on, it ranges, a talent was somewhere between 16 to 20 years of labor. So this is significant even though if you just have one. So the master, before he goes out, he gives one servant five, the next servant two, and the third servant one talent. And it says that he did this in accordance with their ability, based off of what they're able to do, right? And so the master goes away. The five doubles what he has, now has ten. The, the two now gains two, and the person with one buries theirs in the dirt. The master comes back and says, hey, what did you do with what I gave you? The five says, I doubled it. And then the master says, well done, good and faithful servant. Goes to the two that gained two and says, well done, good and faithful servant. Gets to the third, to the one and buried it. And this is where we pick it up in Matthew 25, verses 24 and 25. Matthew chapter 25, verses 24 and 25. It says, the man who had received one talent approached his master and said, master, I know you. You're a harsh man, reaping where you haven't sown, gathering where you haven't scattered seed. So I was afraid. And I went off and I hid your talent in the ground. But see, you, you have what is yours. 
And many of you have read this, heard this before, but the master was not pleased. He said, wicked and and lazy servant, why didn't you take what I gave you and put it in the bank? At At least I would get a return of some interest off of that. Of course, banking nowadays, it's not much interest you get off of that. But at least I'll get some interest off of that, just a simple investment like that. But instead, it points to us, you know, sometimes the things that can mobilize us, or sorry, can immobilize us, keep us from using what we've got, is, man, we're just paralyzed with fear. Well, I don't want to do the wrong thing. I don't want to mess this up. Or even like this servant, we have a wrong perspective of even about who God is, that he's just so hard and so harsh. He's going to reap where he hasn't even sown. He's just so difficult to please, my goodness. And so I'm just going to hide. I don't know if I can even do anything right now. I'm just going to lease. I'm I'm not going to lose it. My goal is not to lose this. Meanwhile, God's a giver. He gave that to you for you to... To use it. My encouragement to you today is to, man, to put it to use that, that don't fall into the, the lies of fear and the, and the traps of, oh, you know, the fear of failing. What if I do the wrong thing? What if I do the wrong way? What if I, what if I mess up? You probably will. Isn't that fun? But God's grace is sufficient for every step. His mercies are new every morning. Or maybe the thoughts of like, well, about my time, I'm just, I'm just too busy. And, and these different things that hold us back. And, and people get so stuck when it comes to moving into something specific to begin to serve and, and work that muscle and begin to develop and to grow in that way. Is they go, well, I'm just waiting on God to give me the specific thing. I'm just waiting on God. And God's going, I've already been calling your phone. Why don't you pick up? I'm waiting on the call. Waiting, waiting on... On the thing, and, and, and I have to encourage you with this: Don't wait for perfection. Start with motion. Just to start moving. For me personally, the first place this I'd served in different things earlier, growing up in different areas. But the first place that I, I served, whenever I uh, came here, we moved from Tulsa, Oklahoma, up into this area, and um, I was in high school. I was 15 at the time. And the first place I got involved, I was at youth group, and it wasn't at this location, previous location before here. Um, but I was in there, I was there early, and so just kind of hanging out, and somebody approached me and said, hey, since you're here, I know this, you're here early, uh, would you like to get involved in serving by being a greeter? Now, I'll be honest with you, greeting is not my life goal, okay? It's not my greatest gifting, our greatest calling, I'm not saying that I'm unfriendly. I'm not like, damn, yeah, whatever. Like, it's not that, okay. But at the same time, that's not the thing I'm like, yeah, that's my place, right. But I said yes to it. Why? No, I may not necessarily be specifically gifted and called to, like, be a greeter. That's not my, my life call. But you know what my call is? To be a servant. I mean, I don't know what the details of your calling is. I don't know what you might think it is, and it may very well be that, and and what's all attached to that. But can I tell you, you know what it's going to involve? Serving. So don't wait for perfection. Don't wait to just just get moving. Have you ever tried to steer a parked vehicle? (laughs) Thanks to power steering, you can at least point somewhere, but you ain't going anywhere. Don't, don't wait for perfection. Just start with motion. Just get going somewhere. I got involved in serving with, as a greeter. Eventually moved into serving a little bit more aligned in some giftedness areas within worship. And then began to do that. And that grew eventually on staff within worship, within the youth group. Then within the youth group and within young adults leading worship. And then doing worship within here for seven years. And then and you just keep taking steps. Because if it's not the thing, it'll be the thing that leads to the thing. Start with motion. Start with motion, not perfection, because ultimately the greatest ability that God is looking for us to give to him is our availability. Here I am. Send me. I want to use it. I have something to give because he's given me something. And I want to use it. And the third phrase, our final big point, if you will, is use it to serve others. Use it to serve others. And this gets to, there's basically three options that we have. 
in relation to the gifts God has given us. One we just talked about, which is to neglect them. And we don't use it. The second one is that we can use them to serve ourselves. And the third one is that we can use them to serve others. And it's no shocker to you, to any of us, that we, we live in a world and we have flesh like anybody. It's so easy to be self-focused. It's, it's so easy. We all have to wrestle against self-centeredness and, and selfishness and, and self-checkout lines at Walmart. I mean, there's just a lot of self everywhere pulling on us. But I just want to point you to something that man, somebody's need is waiting on your gift. And there's somebody's need that's just waiting on your yes. Your I'm just available. Somebody's need waiting on your service. Whatever area it is, whether it's inside of these walls, these locations, or beyond them, and likely it's, it's a both and. But somebody's need is on the other side of it. And I love this in Matthew chapter 25, verses 31 through 40. It shows us the significance of our service to others. Matthew 25, verses 31 through 40, Jesus telling this account, and some consider this a parable, allegorical, but, but it really seems to read like this is, this is going to happen. It's, it's not an if, it's, it's a when. And Jesus says in Matthew 25, verse 31, he starts by saying, When the Son of Man, which is a title he used to refer to himself, when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit upon his glorious throne. And all the nations will be gathered in his presence. He will separate the people as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will place the sheep at his right hand and the goats at his left. And then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the creation of the world. And this is why. For I was hungry, and you fed me. I was thirsty, and you gave me a drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me into your home. I was naked, and you gave me clothing. I was sick, and you cared for me. And I was in prison. And you visited me. And then these righteous ones will reply, Lord, when did we ever see you hungry and feed you? Or thirsty and give you something to drink? Or a stranger and show you hospitality? Or naked, I feel like I would have remembered that. And give you clothing? When did we ever see you sick or in prison and visit you. And then here's the king's response. The king will say, this is the big idea, I tell you the truth. When you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you were doing it to me. He takes it personally. I think about whenever Jesus appeared to a man named Saul who was persecuting the church. He appears to him this bright light and, and it blinds him. But, but Jesus said to him, he didn't say, first of all, he didn't say, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting my church? He said, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? You're not just doing it to just some people that, that you can see. You're doing it to me, the one that you, know, you can't see with your eyes. But... He takes it personally. And I think about the amazing significance of our service that we can serve the needs of Jesus by serving the needs around us. That right now, each campus and location in, in these rooms, back in our children's spaces, man, Jesus is in there with a need. And that Jesus is over whether the children's space or the student ministry space or, or, man, there, or there's somebody that came in the building and, and this may be you today, whether you're in the building you, online, but who said, God, I'm going to give you one last shot today. It's Jesus with a need. Or maybe it's somebody that you see at Walmart outside the building there or in line or the person, the cashier that, 
or that Jesus is coming this week to our Help Your Neighbor food pantry and food distribution and he has a need. And what are those? Those are opportunities to serve Jesus personally by serving him. And the first application of this actually by, by implications, other parts of scripture, you know, most of the references, not all, not all, this is a both and, just to be clear, but most of the references aren't really about Christians loving the world. There is that. But most of them are about Christians loving Christians. He said, by this, the world will know that you are my disciples. He didn't say your love for the world. He said your love for one another. Why? Because if it ain't working at home, why do I want what you got? Easy to love people that are at a distance. The people are close, more opportunity for friction, more opportunity for even offense and things. What? And that's the significance of loving one another. And when I do that, I'm actually loving Jesus himself. And so here's the question, here's the application. Many of you may already be doing this, but I want to just encourage you, think practically, where, where am I serving? Like predictably, I'm on the schedule, so to speak. Like predictably, I'm, I'm serving. This is, if you will, my ministry. You know the word for ministry is the word for serving? Well, I'm not a minister. Do you serve? Boom, minister. There you are. You have a ministry, a service. Whether it's cleaning a bathroom, whatever it looks like. But where is it? And no, you may not just land in it like day one. There's often a discovery process. But hey, let's, let's, just, let's just start. Let's just get moving. Where, where is it? Where is it that you're starting to get mobilized into serving in a predictable pattern and way? What's the impact he's called you to make through it? Because he's gifted you with something. He intends for you to use it, to apply it somewhere for the benefit of other people, the expansion of God's kingdom. And Jesus says, thank you. Thank you for meeting my need. Thank you for serving me. Thank you for blessing me. But maybe this first step for some of you today, whether you're here in the room, joining us through the camera lens today is, you know, I don't know that I've received the ultimate gift of Jesus. And so I want to give you a chance. If you would, just everyone bow your heads, close your eyes with me. And I just want to give an invitation today, wherever you may be, to receive the gift of Jesus as your Savior and as your Lord. This is, I'm not asking you, have you been a good person? I'm not asking, have you been baptized or confirmed? Or I'm not asking about that. This isn't a commitment to any, any of those type of things. I'm not even asking, you know, how bad have you been? Can, can you get in? Can you, no, this is a gift. You didn't earn it, you don't deserve it. If any other religious observance or practice could make you right with God, God would have sent those things. But he didn't send any other thing but himself. He sent Jesus. Have you received the fact that he paid for your sin and rose from the dead? And he wants to make you new, not just better, not hand you a list of rules and morality and, and things. Okay, well, you now you got to start coming to church now. If you just do enough of that, you'll be good. No. Have you received the gift of his grace that saves you through Jesus? Have you done that? If the answer is no or I'm not sure, you can do that today. We're going to pray a prayer out loud together with you right where you are. But first I want to give you a chance on the count of three just to lift your hand, to acknowledge before God. Say, God, I respond to what you did through Jesus. I choose Jesus today. I receive the gift. On the count of three, if that's you, every location, would you put your hand up high where we can see it? One, two, three. Put up high. I choose Jesus today. God bless you. I see it. God bless you. Lift up high for a second. Then you put it right back down in every location. The campus pastors, the team there can see you, acknowledge you. I may not be able to see you, but they can. Online, put it in the chat. I choose Jesus today. Man, we are so excited for you. It's the best decision of your life. And just to encourage you in that decision, we're all going to pray this prayer out loud together with you. Just repeat it after me. Most importantly, mean it from your heart as you do so, because it's that faith of your heart that's saving you, not just saying the words, but repeat this out loud after me. Say, Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for Jesus. I believe he is the Son of God. He died on a cross so I could be saved. And he rose from the dead so I could have a new life. Jesus, I confess you as my Savior, 
and my Lord. I turn from my sin and I turn to you. And I am now a child of God. And heaven is my home. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Come on, let's celebrate today. Awesome, awesome. I want to give you a few next steps in just a minute. But first, I just want to share a story with you from a member, member of our church. His name is Bruce. And his story of how he, he made that move from, yes, beginning to, to sit, if you will, to be a part of the church in that regard. But how God led him on a journey to not just be sitting, but also get involved in being sent and begin to serve. So, whoop. Okay. So check out this video. My name is Bruce Curry. About 17 years ago, I was driving up and down 19, back and forth to work, and I saw the Cranberry Campus being built. Uh, so I saw the one weekend it was open. I started attending the following weekend, and it just spoke to me, it reached out, and just sort of woke me up to God's Word. So I was coming to Victory and just kept coming, and I came for 13, 14 years and never really got connected you know, I was approached about serving a couple times, but just never dawned on me to jump in and to do it. I don't know if it was the intimidation of being a large church, and maybe I felt like, uh, you know, I was an outsider, or maybe it just was not for me at the time. So my son was serving uh, in production in the adult service. And he said, Dad, come on, let's come see what I do. So I came and saw what he was doing and I uh, thought, oh, interesting. He was, hey, hey, let me show you how to run the camera. And uh, so my son actually taught me how to run the camera and got, you know, it was my son who got me to serve. And I kept doing it and kept doing it. And pretty soon they started scheduling me and I became part of the production team. Through serving, I've made friendships that have just blessed me in ways I didn't realize I needed. And through those friendships, it developed me into going into small groups. And then you just, you spiritually, you grow from there. Uh, and once you start that, you know, coming from the serving part into the small groups and continue serving, God starts working in your life in ways you, you never know he could. So if you're like I was and you've been coming for a while and you haven't got connected and serving, just let me encourage you, please do so. You will not regret it.